On this episode of What the Ship, U.S. container imports see biggest drop in over a decade. The U.S. military completes the recovery of a Chinese spy balloon off the coast of the Carolinas. Russia's shadow tanker fleet swells. The Baltic dry index has collapsed. And shipping calls on the U.N. to evacuate hundreds of seafarers stuck in Ukraine. I am your host, Sal McCogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So we start off with a great image, that of the Goodyear blimp flying over the Daytona 500 this weekend. The crew of the blimp is taking cautions, worried about the fans of NASCAR taking a pot shot at the Goodyear balloon flying high over Daytona. Uh, probably a smart move on their part. But we're going to talk about Chinese balloons, we're going to talk about ocean shipping, and how all this relates to you. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into story number one. All right, story number one. Okay, I'm laughing about the balloon still. It still makes me laugh quite a bit. All right, story number one is not a laughing matter, but this is the latest from John McCowan's report on container shipping. Mike Schuller over at G Captain did a synopsis of it. U.S. container imports see biggest drop in over a decade. When you get into the data here, it is a bit disturbing. In the latest ports report, John McCowan said inbound containers at the 10 largest U.S. ports declined 17.9% year over year in January, marking the highest monthly decline since the 2008 financial crisis. However, I got to call time out on this. Mike makes the point here, and it's really important to make this, is that 2022 was a record year. I mean, record year. I mean, through the charts record year. So coming down almost 18% sounds very dramatic, and it is dramatic. But let's be clear, we are still at basically pre-COVID numbers here coming down. But what we're seeing is where is the bottom in this fall? That's what we're trying to find out here. Going on here, John makes some other key points. West Coast, West Coast ports, once the biggest, uh, once again, the biggest declines in January down 23.5% year over year. So we're seeing the West Coast losing out to the East and Gulf Coast ports. They mark the issue here as potential labor unrest continues to strain on volumes. We're going to talk about that in a second. So John's report here really hits on a key issue here that we're seeing declining in containers coming into the United States, which means decrease in merchandise. But we're also seeing a shift in where that container is going. And that plays out in this story from Lodestar, which talks about the bad news for ocean carriers as contract rates trending towards spot. So spot charters are basically what you can get right now to book a container. It's not long term, it's short term. It's basically trying to get it on a boat right now. Now, spot charters make up about 30% of ocean shipment. The 70% are long term rates. But what we're seeing here is the delta, the difference between long term and short term rates is declining. And we're seeing pre-COVID numbers coming down here. And what we're seeing is the big ocean carriers are forcing to make agreements with their shippers to bring their contract rates down closer to the spot rate. Now, we are in the bottom of the cycle here. February is always a low month. Did a video the other day talking about containers falling and tankers rising. And that video highlights that issue that for the past five years, from January to February, we always see a decrease. But then in March, we see an uptick. The question is, how much is that uptick going to be? We just don't know right now because there's so many variables in this marketplace. Going on here, look at some ports around the world. So the Port of LA sees softer trade to start the year. So the Port of LA did their monthly meeting. Uh, Gene Soroka came out and tried to spin this as much as he can. But let's be clear, the Port of LA and Long Beach and Oakland, and Tacoma, and Seattle, and all the West Coast ports have an issue, and that is this ongoing labor dispute. I know, I get to hear it all the time, and I'll hear it in the comments, that the ILWU and the PMA are not going to have a strike, there's not going to be a slowdown, yada, yada, yada. They said the same thing in 2014, 2015, and there was. And as long as that's hanging out there, it's going to impact where containers go, especially when rates are going down from Asia to Europe and from Europe to the United States East Coast or via the Neo-Panamax lane of the, of the Panama Canal. That lane did not exist in 2014, 2015. It does today. And more importantly, there's excess capacity on vessels to haul 
along the Asia to Europe route on these ultra-large container vessels. That is key. And so Los Angeles can say well, all they want, that they're open for business and they have these great low rates. But until they dr- address the issues, and I'm just talking about the labor dispute. I'm not talking about things like AB5 for independent truckers. I'm not talking about California laws, which make uh, 2010 trucks no longer legal to operate in and around the ports. I'm not talking about Class 1 rail issues. I mean, Class 1 rail is a disaster, especially after the derailments we've just saw. We have all those issues to get goods from the West Coast to the East Coast, and the Port of L.A. has got to address the issues it can deal with directly, and that is the labor dispute. They need to get that resolved. It's been hanging over them since July 1st. Going on here, the port of Karachi in in Pakistan is having issues. This story from Bloomberg. Shipping containers with billions of dollars worth of imports are stuck at Pakistan's ports. This has to do to the potential credit uh, default by the nation of Pakistan. The story right here uh, talks about it. Pakistan's $3.19 billion in foreign currency reserves mean that the nation is unable to fund imports, stranding thousands of container supplies on its ports and stalling production, putting jobs at risk. And inflation that's also at the fastest in almost half a century is putting many goods out of public's reach. Port of Karachi is a major port. And when you see goods not moving in and out of ports, that clogs the port up and that causes problems down the supply chain. We're seeing that right now in Pakistan. And then, of course, we have the issue with the port of Eskendron. I just had on Allison Cusack, the shipping lawyer, on. We did a great 40-minute talk about what's next for the port of Eskendron. Just saw today that a second earthquake hit that area. So we're not even sure, based on this story, which was posted earlier today by Sam Chambers, whether or not Eskendron is going to get back to normal operations within three months. So there is a lot going on here that we just don't know in the industry, especially in the container sector right now. So it's an interesting market to be looking at. I did a video the other day on containers versus tankers. And one of the things that's very clear is the container market's going down. And so hopefully people have bailed on their positions in the container market, whether you're doing Triton and 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 and, and the lessees that, that finance the containers for it, whether it's the container companies themselves, uh, Zim and... Uh, uh, Matson, for example, or it's the leasing companies that lease out the container uh, ships, Custom Air, Atlas, that lease the container ships out. So a lot of variable positions hanging out there right now. And we're definitely seeing that in the container market. All right, let's go ahead and story number two. Story number two, I, I got sucked into this story the other day uh, by uh, Sam Legrone over at USNI News. And so I figured I'd address it today because there was actually two stories I want to talk about in this one. But this one here from Reuters, U.S. military completes recovery of Chinese spy balloon off of South Carolina. I live in North Carolina, so I did my part. I was on my roof with my shotgun trying to shoot down some Chinese balloons. Unfortunately, it, it 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 got away from me. I just I just could not. I was not. I'm just kidding. That's don't don't shoot at Chinese balloons. You're not going to hit them. Although I still laugh about the Goodyear blimp at the beginning of this video. But this story was really interesting because one of the things that was done here, the reason this balloon was shot down where it was, was because it was in U.S. territorial waters. They didn't allow it to go outside the 12 mile limit which means it's in U.S. territorial waters. They shot it down over shallow water, 40 to 50 feet, prevented from dispersing over a large area. And they prepositioned vessels in the area. You see a landing ship out there. But more importantly, they brought in a survey vessel, the Pathfinder, which has on board uh, unmanned underwater vehicles so that they can track it and find it. And they were able to really use some Navy uh, destroyers with their very sophisticated radars to track the debris as it came down. So they were able to gather up this material. Now, we know other balloons have been potentially shot down. We're not sure if they were Chinese uh, satellite balloons or, or, or spy balloons or if they were weather balloons or if there were some <laughs> kids spe- special project. We just don't know. But one's off the North Shore of Alaska, one's in the Yukon, one's in Lake Huron. And I'll address two of those real quick. North Shore of Alaska, very difficult to operate in. Just really difficult. Not a great area, especially in wintertime, to get up and operate in. So it's going to be really hard to get in that area to get it. Lake Huron, just not a lot of assets in the Lake Huron area to, to do it. There's a lot of underwater assets there that you can use for NOAA and the Canadian Coast Guard and the U.S. Coast Guard. 
but not a lot of naval uh, uh, assets there. But again, it's a good spot to do, but it's a deep lake. You got to be careful about where you shoot it down over Lake Huron because there are some really deep areas in there. But again, this goes back to a larger issue is Chinese military presence around the world. And the second aspect of this story is this one right here, another G-Captain story, this one from Bloomberg. China says it plans naval exercises with Russia and South Africa. This is going to take place this week. And you may be sitting there going, well, wait a minute, why is China exercising with South Africa? Seems like a strange combination. Look at where China has established itself militarily. It has a base in Djibouti, the very southern entrance of the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean. It's talking about setting up a base in West Africa. It's talking about setting up a base in southern Argentina by the Drake Passage between southern tip of South America and Antarctica. All three of those are astride main shipping routes for Chinese products, imports, exports, their merchant marine, and ships that are plying to and from China. South Africa is astride the Cape Route, Cape of Good Hope. This is where the large bulk and grain vessels come in, the Cape vessels. And so the southern tip of South Africa is essential for Chinese trade and movements. One of the things you see is you got to get out of your mind that the Chinese Navy is going to go toe-to-toe against the U.S. Navy. The PLAN, the People's Liberation Army Navy, it's a mouthful, but that's what they call it. The plan is not planning to go toe-to-toe against the Seventh Fleet and the U.S. Navy. Uh, they don't win that. We don't win that either, let's be clear. It'll be a, an atrocious battle between the two sides. However, one thing that the plan does is protect trade. It is a classic Mahanian mercantilistic trade organization. It goes to Djibouti and establishes itself in East Africa dealing with pirates. It will do the same thing in the Drake Passage. It'll do the same thing in West Africa. It'll do the same thing in the southern tip of South America, uh, South Africa, because it knows that if any nation attempts to strangle its trade, it's going to have a detrimental impact on them. China is is principally worried about this. This is why they develop bases in the South China Sea. They are worried about not so much a big nation like the United States, but other nations that could potentially intercede. India, Singapore, Vietnam, Japan, Korea, you name it. Other nations that could potentially hinder Chinese trade. And so this naval exercise is a really interesting element. Is this a first step in China getting basing rights in South Africa? Don't know but it fits with their model of the Belt and Road Initiative. And this deals exactly with trade. I've recommended for a long time a book by Bruce Jones, To Rule the Waves, which talks about how modern shipping has been able to operate largely because of the United States and its allies ensuring freedom of the seas. All right, let's go ahead and story number three. Story number three takes us to tankers. So again, did a video the other day, containers down, tankers up. This is part of that story. The tanker bull run breaks records. Sam Chambers over in uh, Splash uh, 24-7 hits this one. He's talking about charter rates for tankers. But in truth, tankers are just killing it right now. Why is that? Russia, Ukraine. Russia is not exporting oil and diesel anymore to Europe. A short haul from Russia, either via pipelines or small tankers out of the Baltic, out of the Black Sea. Now, instead, those tankers are coming out of the Baltic, coming out of the Black Sea, doing ship-to-ship transfers to larger tankers, and those larger tankers now are hauling that oil and that diesel further to South America, to Africa, to Asia. And that means for tanker companies, this is profitability because a fewer group of ships, a diminishing pool of vessels, because we're not building new tankers, we haven't been building a lot of anything actually recently, but this diminishing pool of tankers now is being sought after more than ever before, plus they're hauling their cargo longer distances, which means there are less available tankers out there. This is profitability for tankers. If two years ago you jumped into containers, well, tankers are where it's at now. And that's what we're seeing happen right here. And if you look at not just Sam's story, but other stories, here's Barry Parker over at G-Captain. Product tankers are hitting it out of the park. These are clean tankers. Uh, uh, Dirty tankers are crude oil tankers. Clean tankers are product tankers. These are gasoline, diesel, refined products. And these tankers, typically smaller than the large crude carriers you see, are the ones that are just making the money right now. And Barry goes in great detail here 
in the story talking about it. And then you get this story from Bloomberg about Russia's shadow tanker fleet swelling. And again, we've talked about this a lot. The fact that the Russians are buying up anything, ships that would typically be heading the scrap with tankers are not going there. And instead, they're joining this large fleet of vessels that could total up to 600 ships. Uh, and these ships are the ones that are being used to haul Russian oil. This is about 10 to 12 percent of the global tanker fleet. And they're being bought up. They're being put into these shell companies operating for c companies under the guise of Russia that are moving Russian oil. Remember, Russian oil isn't under sanctions per se. It's not illegal to haul Russian oil or Russian diesel. You just have to do it under the set price cap, $60 per barrel for crude, $100 for diesel. Now, you can't take that crude and diesel into many countries. The G7, the EU are, are sanctioning it. They're not allowing it in it. However, you can take it to other countries and sell it there. So diesel can be hauled to India, to South America, to Africa. The crude oil can go to Turkey, to India, to China, be refined, and then sold back to the EU and the G7. Because once you refine it, it becomes a new product. And so one of the things we're seeing here is this oil market is really an interesting one. I, I'm telling you, U.S. Navy, other navies around the world have got to get up on what is going on with oil in this market right now, because this is the new illegal trade that's going on below the surface. These ship-to-ship -ship transfers are being done outside of territorial waters of nations. They're not following provisions for uh, a safety and hazards, MARPOL pollution. We could see spills out in the middle of the ocean with these illegal transfers. It's very difficult because of the volume involved to track these vessels. They're turning AIS off. They're going dark. They are maneuvering cargo around. We saw this with Venezuela, with North Korea, oil being moved around. Now you're seeing it on a scale never before seen with Russian oil being moved around. It is going to take a lot of visibility to watch this. And this is the way the Russians are going to fund themselves. It's driving down the price of oil, which is great for everyone. Everyone enjoys cheaper gas and cheaper diesel. However, it's not stopping or, or hurting the Russians the way EU and uh, the G7 thought it would. And instead, it's depressing the cost of oil around the world. And so the price caps are so high compared to what they're selling them for, the Russians are selling increased commodities or quantities of this. And the people who are benefiting are tanker companies who are hauling this oil all around the world at longer distances. It's much more profitable for them. And they're the ones who are just raking in the coal right now of money. All right, let's go to our next story. All right, if Twitter and all the social media was full of balloon experts recently, the other experts that are out there are Baltic Dry Index experts. So this story from Greg Miller, which has, has a great title to it, and it's meant to cause some, some attention, as he does a great job of that. But I don't think it's, it's as bad as he says. Baltic Dry Index has collapsed. Ominous signs for the economy, but then you read the subtext. Starbuck and Golden Ocean significantly outperform tragic index levels. Okay, so the Baltic Dry Index, and you got to be careful about this. So a lot of people confuse the Baltic Dry Index with the Fredos Container Index. Containers are different than Baltic Dry Index. So the Dry Index is measuring grain and ore uh, cargoes, dry cargoes, that are moving around in bulk vessels around the world. And this is the biggest sector in shipping at all, period, bar none. It's, it's bigger than tankers. It's bigger than containers. Uh, this is it. And the index is down. Matter of fact, if you look at this right here, the BDI fell to 530 points on Thursday, down 91% versus October 2021. It goes back here. Uh, since the Baltic index started publishing in 1985, it had only been lower than it is today during two other periods. The first half of 2020, I, I can't remember. Was something going on in early 2020? I, I don't remember. And then second, uh, the first half of 2016 during an economic downturn for the dry bulk sector. Sounds like an ominous sign for the world economy, but there are in industry-specific reasons why things might not be quite as dire as they seem. 
So one of the first things that Greg mentions is a dearth of cargo. And one of the things that this measures in particularly, that this, this thing is skewed, the BDI, to really measuring uh, the spot rates of Cape size vessels. These are the vessels that go around that Southern Cape of Good Hope, the one where the Chinese Navy is exercising. 40% of it is weighed to that capacity. And when Cape size rates decline, it drives down the BDI. And that's what we're seeing right now. The, the Cape size rates are really low because there is a uh, just a dearth of cargo and it's driving down the, the rates. This is one of the reasons why the Chinese Navy wants to exercise off South Africa, because it's really important for them to be able to get their rates. And so what we're seeing now is those rates coming down. Go down here, the vessels fitted with scrubbers are at a premium right now. So right now you have a choice of burning two types of fuel. You can burn very low sulfur fuel oil or high sulfur fuel oil. As of IMO 2020, January 1st of 2020, you are required, if you burn the high sulfur fuel oil, your ships have to have scrubbers. And scrubbers do exactly what it sounds like. It scrubs the exhaust. It removes the sulfur from the exhaust. Now, that is the way to go right now because of the difference in fuel costs. A very uh, low sulfur fuel is really expensive. High sulfur fuel oil is cheaper. And so if you have a scrubber, that's the way to go. You are paying less in fuel. Now, however, one of the things we're starting to see is an attempt to phase out scrubbers. And in particular, some countries are going to be phasing out uh, scrubbers. So what do we see? Uh, fleets like Golden Ocean, for example, which has scrubbers on 48% of its fleet. Uh, and then Starbulk has scrubbers on nearly all, 120 of its 28 ships. That's giving those companies an advantage because they're lowering their fuel costs. There And then you have the other option here of slow steaming. And the slow steaming effect is also playing a goal. IMO 2023 now requires all ships to have a report card on their emissions. So if you have an A, B, and C, you're good to go. If you have a D or an E, I know it's not an F, it's an E, uh, then you're in trouble. You've got to fix it. And, and if you get an E, you, you have to take yourself out of service. If you get three Ds in a row, you have to take yourself out of service. And one of the ways that they're adjusting this is by slow steaming. This is why the CEO of Maersk came out when this went into effect and said, I need a fleet 8 to 15% bigger than what I have right now to handle the cargo. And then there's the optimism on China's reopening. Again, China has shut, closed, shut, closed with COVID. It's been a lot right there. So what we've seen is this kind of back and forth on Chinese openings. Plus, China is now improved relations with countries like Australia, which allows them to get coal and ore and, and other material from them, much shorter distance. That impacts the BDI. And what's interesting is when you look at the stocks of the bulk companies, they have not suffered, even though we're at the lowest level that we've been with the Baltic Dry Index, except for two times. If you look at the companies with the stocks to date, we don't quite see that. And if you look at them, and again, he has all of them here, the stock of bulk owners of Genco, J&K, uh, J&K is up 18% year to date. Eagle Bulk, EGLE, is up 15%. Golden Ocean, 14 Starbuck, 12 Safe Bunkers, uh, Bulkers, 12%. So the bulking market has been doing fairly decent. Not great. I mean, they're nowhere dealing what containers were doing in, in the early uh, 2020, 2021 period. Uh, they're not doing what tankers are doing right now, but bulkers have been pretty steady here. And I think that's an interesting place to look at because the bulk market is, again, the biggest shipping sector in the industry, more tonnage than anything else. And where it goes is a good indication of the health of the economy of the world. All right, let's go to our last story. As always, I pick my last story to be the story that I think is the one that's flying under the radar, doesn't get any attention at all, but really needs to it. And this is this is a story from uh, uh, Splash 24-7. Shipping calls on the UN to evacuate hundreds of seafarers stuck in Ukraine. We are coming up to the one-year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine, February 24th. And according to this, more than 30 shipping organizations and companies are urging the United Nations to prioritize the immediate release of seafarers and ships trapped in Ukraine. There are reported 331 seafarers on board 62 ships trapped in Ukrainian ports. They have been there for a year. 
And many of them cannot get off their ships and return home, either because the companies will not repatriate them or they're sailing under articles you sign shipping articles when you sail international. And typically you sign on for a voyage. So if I sign on a shipping article out of Wilmington, North Carolina, my articles would typically say you sail on for a voyage and that voyage ends when you return back to Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, if you don't return back to Wilmington, North Carolina, your voyage continues on. And that's exactly what is happening for a lot of these seafarers who are stuck on these ships. They can't get off, can't get paid. They don't have enough money to get out and they can't abandon the vessels they're on because they may not be able to get out of the areas they're in. We've already seen mariners die as a result of this. A Bangladesh ship was hit. The uh, third engineer was killed on board. We've seen other vessels hit and struck and, and mariners wounded and killed. So this is an issue that should be addressed immediately. But we have some problems. Russia will not allow a lot of these vessels to evacuate out. Ukraine has got to escort these vessels out because they got to come out through minefields that Ukraine has laid around their ports. So there are a lot of issues at play here that need to be addressed. All the vessels that have been stuck, for example, there is a Costco, a Chinese overseas shipping company container ship that's been stuck in Odessa for a year. And this is a, Ch a Hong Kong flagged vessel. So China would love to get this vessel back. But a lot of these vessels are stuck, can't get out. Yeah, we're moving grain ships in and out, but we're not moving other containers and, and other types of vessels in and out. This needs to be addressed. How these mariners have slipped through the crack for a year is a priority. And I think the UN and the International Maritime Organization need to make this a paramount issue. We keep seeing stories about seafarers being abandoned around the world. Matter of fact, last year was the worst year for seafarers being abandoned. And it's not the big shipping firms. It's not the Marisks. It's not the MSCs. It's, it, it's not the TKs. It is the smaller shipping companies that do this. And when they run into problems, the seafarers become the pawns in this. During the height of COVID, mariners getting home was a big problem. Some of them had to stay past their allotted sea time. They couldn't repatriate because of COVID restrictions. And some mariners were on vessels for over a year. That is detrimental to the good health and sanity of a mariner to be stuck on a ship for that long, especially at the wages some of these companies will pay. And more importantly, it will cost problems down the road because their reliefs will not come out. They'll go get other jobs and the mariners who finally do get off will leave the industry and not want to come back. This is an issue of paramount importance and the IMO and the UN should be addressing this. And it should be a provision that we are really focused on through the International Maritime Organization to see these repatriated mariners get home. I hope you enjoyed today's video. A lot to go over. A lot of balloon stories for some strange reason. I'm not sure why in the shipping channel we have a lot of balloon stories, but we did. But I hope you did enjoy it. If you did enjoy it, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Share it across social media. And if you can, support the page. How do you support the page? Well, first off, don't support Chinese balloons. But if you want to support the page, you can do that by hitting that super thanks button down below. You can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon. You'll see a link at the end of the video and in the show notes. You can become a monthly, yearly subscri subscriber and support the page. But the best way to support the page, the absolute best way to do it, is by subscribing, liking, and sharing across social media. Tell your friends. Make sure they know about it. Do what you can to spread the news about what's going on with shipping and particularly our weekly show, What the ship which provides you 30 minutes of shipping news in five concise stories with great stories about chinese balloons until our next video this is al signing off